always beware a silk possessing new technology in his hand. I'm very intimidated by this thing. Welcome, everybody. It's lovely to see so many of you here. Welcome to what is the fifth Jonathan Hurst QC, not a typo. Uh, sadly, Jonathan will forever remain QC, commercial law lecture. Uh, as any anthropologist will tell you, all tribes honor their dead. Uh, we are no exception at Brick Court. And we honor Jonathan's memory through this series of lectures. The Inner Temple having unaccountably rejected our original proposal, which was a 60 foot burial mound across the main lawn. <laughs> now, I know, listen, I know that lots of you here will have known Jonathan. So what I will tell you about him is completely redundant. But I also know that there are lots of people who will not have known him. And uh, just in, in Chambers, for example, Jonathan died in 2017. Since then, we've taken on 22 new tenants, none of whom ever had the pleasure of meeting him. So I just want to say a very few words about him. Jonathan was a genuinely extraordinary man. He, he was an enormously successful commercial silk. He was head of Chambers. He was treasurer of the Inner Temple. And he was also chairman of the bar. And he was chairman of the bar at a time when the profession was in immense turmoil. And he more or less single-handedly faced down the Blair government and made them drop their plans to abolish the rank of silk. Any one of those achievements would have been enough in a career for most people. But Jonathan was not most people. He, he accomplished them all and his energy and his drive and his abilities were simply off the scale. Funnily enough, though, the, the thing of which Jonathan was most proud in his long glittering list of achievements was, had nothing to do with the law. In 2008, he accepted an appointment as chairman of Good Enough College. Uh, Good Enough College is an amazing uh, institute in Bloomsbury, which was set up in the 30s to provide a accommodation, a home from home in a collegiate atmosphere for overseas postgraduate students. And when Jonathan took over, the college was in a bad way. It was in a bad way financially. It was in a bad way physically. It was buildings were in a terrible state. It, in the middle of all the other things that he was doing, Jonathan spearheaded at first a fundraising drive and then an eight year building and refurbishment program which ended up costing around 40 million pounds. The college was completely transformed. It is now a really important part of London's extraordinary multicultural educational landscape. It was an incredible achievement. And when Jonathan retired as chairman, the trustees wrote him and said, it is a great thing that you have done. And that was Jonathan. He was a doer of great things. Now, that is a lovely segue into my introduction of our lecturer tonight, another doer of great things, Sir Richard Aikens. Uh, even Brick Court Chambers has rarely seen so brilliant a lawyer as Richard. He was the pre-digital version of Westlaw. Uh, <laughs> as a, a hapless junior, a rank to which I cheerfully confessed some years ago, you could ask him literally any legal question. And he would immediately tell you, after a, a short rummage through his frontal cortex, what the relevant authorities were. And he was always right, every single time. And, and in those innocent days, before we all had databases on our desks, on, even on our phones, there was a strict rule in chambers, which was enforced by savage fines measured in bottles of wine, that you were not allowed to say, oh, I think there's a case about that, unless you could produce the alleged case. Uh, now, however hard anybody tried, Richard was never once convicted of an offence under this rule. Not only could he always tell you the name of the case, he could tell you the year, he could tell you the judge, he could tell you the volume of the law reports, and quite often, and I'm not exaggerating here, he could tell you the page of the law report on which the proposition for which you were searching resided. Quite phenomenal. Uh, which reminds me that Jonathan Hurst once told me that he quickly realized uh, quite how clever Richard was when he was in chambers. And seeing 
the superiority of Richard's intellectual abilities above his own, he stole from Richard's desk a copy of Richard's standard form pleading about title to sue under the Bills of Lading Act. He then shamelessly plagiarized it for many years. And he told me he lived in absolute terror of any judge ever asking him to, him to explain some of the subtleties which Richard has devised because he said he didn't get it at all. Richard took Silk after only 12 years in practice, which is an astonishing and richly deserved testament to his abilities. After another 12 or so distinguished years in Silk, he left us for the bench, which given his abilities was sad to us, but was no surprise. 16 years later, having completed his stints in the commercial court and then the court of appeal, we were delighted to welcome him home. As a door tenant, he knew Jonathan really well. He knows commercial law even better. And I'm delighted to introduce him to you tonight as our lecturer for the fifth Jonathan Hurst QC commercial law lecture. Richard. Thank you, Tom, for that over generous introduction. It's an honor to deliver the fifth Jonathan Hurst QC Memorial Lecture. I met Jonathan when he became Nicholas Phillips's pupil about 12 months after I had been in the same position. Once Jonathan became a tenant of One Brick Court, now Brick Court Chambers, of course, he very quickly gained a large practice, at first principally in shipping and insurance work. His ability to master the papers quickly and his certain eye for the key legal and factual points in a case made him very popular with solicitors and lay clients. He did many marine insurance cases, including one where I led him, the Fanti. We managed to win 5-0 in the House of Lords, having lost all the way up to that point. One of Jonathan's marine insurance cases has gone down in Chambers folklore. It's called the Macedonia but you're going to have to wait till the end of this talk to hear the tale. Because Jonathan made such a name for himself as an advocate in many of the marine insurance cases, I decided to give tonight's lecture on a marine insurance topic. The idea for the title came from an award, in inverted commas, of Sir Christopher Stoughton in the Bamburi, which is reported in 1982. This was a test case between a large number of Lloyd's underwriters and owners of the Bamburi and about 70 other ships, which arose out of the detention of many ships in the Persian Gulf in the course of the Iran-Iraq war, which had started in 1980. Sir Christopher Stoughton was appointed as a judicial arbitrator to try those test cases in private, although the award was published. In the award, he said, the political and commercial history of the Western world for the last 200 years is reflected in the cases on war risk insurance. In my view, Sir Christopher was being too cautious in confining the influence of law to war risks insurance. War influenced the development of all insurance, but particularly all aspects of marine insurance. To cover the subject comprehensively, would need a book. Indeed, in 2021, Professor Robert Merkin published two large volumes entitled Marine Insurance, A Legal History, which I've looked at, but deliberately not consulted in detail. My aim is different. It's to take a number of marine insurance topics and particular cases and place them in their historical context in order to show how wars have influenced the development of the law. The topics are all fundamental to marine insurance. First, the doctrine that a contract of marine insurance is, not, is one of the utmost good faith. Secondly, the requirement that a person who insures a ship or cargo or freight must have an insurable interest in that thing insured. Thirdly, the development of the concept of a constructive total loss of an insured thing, be it ship, cargo, or freight. Fourthly, the division of insurance risks into what have become marine risks and war risks. And lastly, 
the development of the doctrine of causation in marine insurance. First, though, a lightning history of marine insurance. Someone joked that the quinquireme of Nineveh from distant Ophir of Macefield's poem Cargoes was probably insured by Phoenician merchants. Insurance law developed by the Rhodians and in the codes of the Ile de Laurent. Modern marine insurance was developed by the Genoese and it came to England in the 16th century at least. There was a statute of 1601 creating a court to deal with marine insurance cases, which referred to a course of dealing commonly called a policy of insurance. A standard form of policy, which became the SG policy, short for ship and goods, was in use in England by the end of the 15th century. This notoriously convoluted wording was formalized by 1779 and astonishingly remained in use virtually unchanged until discarded in the 1980s. The English law of marine insurance was molded by continental treatise writers. The works of French jurists such as Valin, Potier and Amerigon were very influential on 18th century judges, particularly Sir William Murray, Lord Mansfield, Chief Justice of the King's Bench from 1756 to 1788. That period covered the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 63, and the War of American Independence, 1776 to 83. Lord Mansfield decided many marine insurance cases, but to start, I want to examine the case of Carter and Boehm, 1766, one of the most important cases in marine insurance law. This slide shows an engagement in 1755, which is what triggered the Seven Years' War. The event giving rise to the case took place in that war, which was fought in Europe, America, India, and the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia. It's famous in British lies, at least, for Wolfe's victory at Quebec, the British Hanoverian victory at Minden, Admiral Hawke's defeat of the French Navy in Quiberon Bay, and the British victory at the Battle of Plassey, where Robert Clive led troops of the British East India Company. It was, Winston Churchill remarked, the First World War. However, all was not victorious for the British. In Sumatra, the main British East India Company settlement was Ben Colleen, now called Ben Kulu. It was defended by the inaptly named Fort Marlborough. That was more of a factory or settlement, not a military fort to defend attacks by a European enemy. A policy of insurance was taken out in 1760 for one year, backdated to 1759, against the loss of the fort from an attack by a foreign enemy. Here is the, the Fort Marlborough, so-called. The policy was for the benefit of the governor of the fort, George Carter, through the agency of his brother. Mr. Boehm was the underwriter. On the 1st of April 1760, the fort was attacked by a French man of war of 64 guns and a frigate of 20 guns, forces of the French East India Company under the command of Count d'Estaigne. They had the connivance of the Dutch, as Lord Mansfield put it in his judgment. The fort was taken, given over to the Dutch, and the prisoners were sent to Batavia, now Jakarta. The governor, Mr. Carter, brought a claim on the insurance for the loss of goods, totaling some £50,000. The underwriter pleaded in defence that there had been a fraud by concealment of circumstances which ought to have been disclosed, in particular the weakness of the fort and the probability of being attacked by the French. The response was that those facts were universally known to every merchant upon the exchange in London. At the trial, the special jury of merchants found for the claimant, 
but the defendant sought a new trial on the issue of law of whether there had been a concealment by the insured of relevant facts, such as to vitiate the policy. In his famous judgment, Lord Mansfield made his ruling on the duty of an insured to disclose all material facts which he knew. Good faith forbids either party by concealing what he privately knows to draw the other party into a bargain from his ignorance of that fact and his believing the contrary. The reason for this was to encourage good faith, but the insured may innocently be silent of things which the underwriter knows or ought to know. Lord Mansfield said that this governing principle of good faith applied to all contracts. In doing so, as his biographer CJS Fifoot put it, Lord Mansfield strained the digestion of the common law. In the 21st century, under the care of Lord Leggett, the digestion has become more robust or more accommodating, depending on how you want to look at it. On the facts of the case, Lord Mansfield concluded that there had been no concealment, that the underwriters either did or should have known of the condition of the fort, and that when the policy was taken out, there was no knowledge of a likely attack by the French. Many cases on the duty of utmost good faith followed Carter and Byrne. The principle was codified in the Marine Insurance Act 1906 in sections 17, 18 and 19. The first of those sections has been modified and the latter two replaced and uh, by a duty of fair presentation by the insured in the Insurance Act 2015. That phrase, fair presentation, reflects the very phrase used by Lord Mansfield himself in Carter and Byrne when he said, the question therefore must be always whether there was, under all the circumstances at the time the policy was underwritten, a fair presentation. Since the 2015 Act, there's been a debate about the extent of the post-contract duty of utmost good faith, but there can be no doubt that the war led to the case that has been the foundation of modern marine insurance law on this topic. Next, insurable interest. In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, when the marine insurance industry was growing in London, there was no settled principle that a person who took out an insurance on a ship or cargo or the maritime adventure had to have some kind of legal interest in the thing insured. That is to say that he had an insurable interest. Effectively, a person could bet on whether the ship or cargo would be lost on the voyage. These were gaming policies and they were perfectly legal and were enforced by the courts. The standard wording in those days was of interest or no interest without benefit of salvage, as in the policy in Carter and Byrne. Later, the wording was policy proof of interest or PPI. Gaming policies became notorious and underwriters lost lots of money on them. So they were made illegal, at least with regard to British ships and cargoes by the Marine Insurance Act 1745. From then on, the issue of whether an insured was wagering or had some legal interest in the subject matter of the insurance became of crucial importance, but its ambit was uncertain. Now we get to the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. These were the last in a series of wars between France and England, Britain, between 1689 and 1815, another 100 years war, effectively. In all those wars, the British tried to keep involvement on the continent to a minimum, often subsidizing allies to provide the land armies. The British relied on the Royal Navy, not always with complete success, for example, in the War of American Independence. The British system, including blockading French ports, here it's Toulon, and those of its allies and the Navy and privateers captured French and allied cargo ships. 
These were then taken either to Britain or to some other port or in a British colony where the captors would hope to have the ship and cargo condemned as prize. The prize courts had been established in the 17th century as part of the High Court of Admiralty. There were vice admiralty courts of prize in British colonies such as Jamaica. That court alone condemned prizes worth £2,300,000 during the Revolutionary War. Prize money was, to use the phrase of the distinguished naval historian N.A.M. Roger, the traditional balm to the wounded naval spirit. Admirals and captains could become rich on prize if they were in the right station during the war. There were legal dangers in capturing a ship for prize, for if it turned out to be a neutral ship, the prize court could award damages which the captain of the capturing ship had to pay. Law is a bottomless pit, and I have no inclination to fathom its depths, said one Commodore, when it, it, he refused to consider taking a Danish prize. However, taking the captured ship back to Britain, or to another prize court, in order for it to be a judged prize, involved the usual maritime risks, as well as that of recapture. After the Battle of Trafalgar, where a number of French and Spanish ships were captured, there was a huge storm, and a large part of the potential prize was lost. So obviously, one way of dealing with this possibility of loss was to use insurance. The case of Lucina and Crawford in 1806 concerned eight Dutch ships, which had been captured by HMS Scepter, commanded by Captain Easington, in company with some East India Company men of war on the 10th of June, 1795. At the time, the United Provinces were a reluctant ally of France. An order in council authorizing the capture of Dutch ships and cargo and setting up a board of commissioners whose task was to bring them to London and then to sell them once condemned as prize was passed. The chief commissioner was Mr. James Crawford. Royal Navy ships carrying letters of mark authorizing them to seize enemy ships were under instructions from the Admiralty to take all ships and cargoes belonging to subjects of the United Provinces and to bring them to Britain. Eight ships were captured off the Cape of Good Hope and taken to St. Helena. A policy of marine insurance, underwritten by Lucina, was made in favour of Mr. Crawford and the other commissioners. On the voyage to Britain, four ships were lost. The commissioners claimed on the policy, arguing that the ships and cargoes had been lost by perils of the seas. The defence was that the commissioners had no interest in the ships at the time they were lost. The case was argued in the Exchequer and Exchequer Chamber, where the claimants won on the point. It then went to the House of Lords, where, under the custom of the time, ten judges of the Exchequer Chamber and Common Pleas were summoned to give their opinion on eight questions put to them by the Lord Chancellor, Lord Eldon. Question five asked if the claimants had an interest in the ships and cargoes so that a legal and valid assurance could be effected on the said goods and on the bodies of the said ships. On that question, the judges were divided. The majority said yes, but two judges, Mr. Justice Chamber and Mr. Justice Lawrence, said no. The judgment of Mr. Justice Lawrence was accepted, has been accepted as being the best analysis of the concept of an insurable interest. The great writer of the standard text on marine insurance, Joseph Arnold, described Mr. Justice Lawrence as that learned master of maritime law. Effectively, his judgment was adopted by Lord Eldon, by then a former Lord Chancellor, Lord Edinburgh, Chief Justice of the King's Bench, and Lord Erskine, the new Lord Chancellor, who, it seems from the reports, had actually argued the case for the claimants in the Exchequer Chamber and the House of Lords before he came to give judgment. No conflict of interest then. However, at a retrial, it was held that the commissioners could claim 
on the insurance on behalf of the king, who was said to have an interest in the ships and cargo at the time of their loss. At the time that this case was being fought out, an attempted invasion by British forces of what is now Argentina and Uruguay was taking place. In the Napoleonic Wars, British trade had actually expanded by 60% and its merchant marine had grown from 1.4 to 1.8 million tonnes. The city had received money seeking security from continental financial centres such as Amsterdam and Frankfurt. The marine insurance industry boomed. British administrations were anxious uh, always to increase trade and to find new markets through Sachange. And a particular area was that of the River Plate, where trade had been growing since the 1780s. In 1804, Spain had allied herself with France. The success of Trafalgar and a successful invasion of the Cape of Good Hope led to a, an unofficial expedition of Royal Navy ships under Commodore Sir Home Popham, with the aim of conquering the Viceroyalty of Buenos Aires in the tottering Spanish Empire. It failed dismally. Popham was court-martialed, but the Grenville administration, the soi-disant Ministry of All the Talents, which actually abolished the slave trade, decided nevertheless to send reinforcements. The next administration was equally ambitious. It wanted to open up the South American markets to British manufacturers and take over the Peruvian gold and silver mines. In this second attempted invasion, the naval squadron was commanded by Admiral Sir Charles Sterling. Again, it was ultimately unsuccessful and the commander, Lieutenant General Sir John Whitlock, was court-martialed and cashiered. That's the surrender at Montevideo. <coughs> in the course of an attack on Montevideo in the second expedition, a ship called Prize No. 3, along with other vessels, was captured from the Spaniards by the conjoined forces of the Army and the Navy. She and her cargo were insured by a prize agent on behalf of Sir Walter Sterling and other captors. She was lost by perils of the seas on her homeward voyage and the captors claimed on the insurance. There were two issues, whether the prize agent had acted on the behalf of the captors and whether they had an insurable interest before the condemnation of the vessels as prize. Alternatively, did the king have an interest? In which case it was said that there was no evidence that the agent had acted on his behalf. The Court of King's Bench, on an application for a new trial on the legal issue, concluded that the captors had an insurable interest because they had actual possession of the vessel after its capture. The important point of law made by Lord Edinburgh, Ellenborough was that a person who, has, who had a mere defeasible interest in goods could nevertheless have an insurable interest. That was like a consignee of goods whose interest may be defeated by loss or stoppage in transit. It was more than a mere expectation. The law on insurable interest, as expounded in these cases, has been codified in Section 5 of the Marine Insurance Act. There has been argument on the margins of the doctrine, but the principles have stood firm. Suggestions by the Law Commission that the law on insurable interest should be amended or that the doctrine should be abolished have not met with approval. Next, the doctrine of constructive total loss of insured property. This is a doctrine that is exclusive to marine insurance. It doesn't exist in other forms of insurance, although something like it has evolved through the cases particularly in relation to aviation insurance. CTL is a topic that's in the legal news at present because of the war in Ukraine. The concept is simple. An insured can claim as for a total loss of the subject matter insured, even when it's not completely lost by an insured peril, such as when sunk or when blown up, provided the insured can show that the object's ultimate loss appears to be unavoidable 
or its loss could not be avoided without an expenditure that would be more than the object's value after the expenditure is incurred. If an insured wishes to claim for a CTL, as it's known, then he has to give a notice of abandonment of the insured property to the insurer. In practice, insurers never accept a notice of abandonment, but agree to put the insured in the same position as if proceedings had been started. In the old days, the slip was marked writ issued. The insured has to prove that at the time of the notice and its rejection by underwriters, it was in fact deprived of the ship or the cargo, and it was unlikely it would recover it, or that the cost of recovering it would be more than its worth. The doctrine of CTL developed from cases where ships and cargo had been captured by enemy forces in time of war. The SG policy wording included amongst the perils ensured those of men at war, enemies, pirates, rovers, arrests, restraints, and detainments of all kings, princes, and peoples of what nation, condition, or quality whatsoever. Characteristically, a ship would be captured by an enemy ship or privateer, then recaptured by British forces. The insured might attempt to abandon the ship to the underwriter, and the issue for the court was whether there had been a total loss at the time of the abandonment notice being given to the underwriter. Two early cases, both decided by Lord Mansfield, demonstrate the difficulty. First, Goss and Withers, 1758. There were two policies, one on the hull of the David and Rebecca, and the other on her cargo of fish. The vessel was badly damaged in a storm, and a quarter of the cargo was jettisoned in the course of her voyage from Newfoundland to a discharge port in Portugal or Spain. Then she was captured by the French on the 23rd of December 1756, and her master and crew taken off and carried to France. The ship remained in French hands for eight days, then was retaken by a British privateer. The ship and cargo that remained were taken to Milford Haven, but the cargo of fish was then rotten. On the 18th of January 1757, the insured offered to abandon the ship and cargo, but that was rejected. The issues of law were whether the capture created a loss and whether the insured had the right to abandon the ship and cargo to the insurers. Yes, said Lord Mansfield, at the time the ship and cargo were abandoned, there had been a loss by capture. The subsequent recapture did not restore the property to the insured because salvage had to be paid, the voyage had to be abandoned, the charter party was dissolved, the freight was lost, and the ship and cargo had to be brought into an English port when the cargo was rotten. Therefore, the insured had the right to abandon once the ship was brought to Milford Haven and could recover. Secondly, Hamilton and Mendes, just three years later in 1761. There, the Selby and her cargo of tobacco were insured for a voyage from Virginia to London. On the 6th of May, 1760, she was taken by a French privateer, Aurora, hailing from Bayonne. The English crew were taken off and were sailed, and she, the ship, was sailed to Bayonne. Near the port, the vessel was retaken by a Royal Navy ship, the Southampton, under the command of Captain Antrobus, who took her to Plymouth on the 6th of June. The owner sent notice of abandonment on the 23rd of June. It was rejected, although the insurer offered to pay the cost of salvage, paid to the Royal Navy ship, and any other expenses. The ship had suffered no damage, and the cargo was delivered later in London. The claim for a total loss failed. Lord Mansfield stated that the right to claim for a loss like this depended on the true situation when the notice of abandonment was given. And if at that time, in this case after the vessel had got to Plymouth, the advice shows the peril to be over and the thing in safety, he cannot elect to abandon at all, because he has no right to abandon when the thing is safe. He distinguished Gosson Withers, where he said that at the time of abandonment, 
the whole ship and cargo were literally lost. The cargo had been partly jettisoned and the voyage entirely lost. The fish had perished and the time it got, by the time it got to Milford Haven and the ship shattered. The rule that's in determining that there has been a total loss at the time of the abandonment depended upon the ultimate state of facts rather than what was thought to be the case at the time was firmly established or confirmed in Naylor and Taylor in 1829. That was a case of a capture on the River Plate again of a ship called Monarch, this time by a Brazilian warship. The Emperor of Brazil had declared a blockade of the ports of the government of Buenos Aires and the ship was thought to be running the blockade. Chief Justice Lord Tenderton gave the judgment of the court and confirmed that the rule that the ultimate state of facts had to be considered was enforced. That remained the law. Two particular problems about deciding when a CTL occurred remain. First, what was the degree of deprivation that was needed? Secondly, how long did the insured have to be deprived of the possession of the insured subject matter before it could be said that he was unlikely to recover it? On the first, there was an important case which arose out of the siege of Paris. And this is a photograph of Paris during the siege in 1870. You will recall that the Franco-Prussian War was engineered by Bismarck and Napoleon III of France fell into the trap. Although the French mobilized first and made some advances, the Prussian armies had a decisive victory at Sedan and Napoleon III abdicated. Gambetta led the new provisional Republican government, but the Prussian armies advanced to Paris where they laid siege on the 20th of September. The siege lasted until the armistice was declared on the 26th of January, 1871. France then suffered the indignity of having to cede much of Alsace-Lorraine to Prussia and pay huge reparations. Meanwhile, the facts of Rodokanach in Elliot took place. The consignment of silks from Shanghai to London had been insured at Lloyd's against, amongst other perils, arrests, restraints, and detainment of all kings, princes, and peoples, etc. The silks were sent by ship to Marseille and then transported by train to Paris, arriving on the 18th of September. The intention had been to send the silks by rail on the Northern Railway from Paris to Boulogne and then ship the goods to Dover and transport them to London by train. But the Prussian army had seized the Northern Railway and then the siege of Paris began. Although the silks were not touched or damaged, it was impossible to move them from Paris. The assured gave notice of abandonment on the 7th of October, 1870, claiming a CTL of the goods. The principal issue before the Court of Exchequer Chamber was whether the fact that the goods could not move from Paris meant that the insured was deprived of possession of the goods by reason of restraint of kings or princes. Yes, said Baron Bramwell, a distinguished commercial judge. What he said was, we have to look at whether, by the immediate and direct pressure of the German army, the goods were prevented from reaching their destination. A siege like the present, which was intended to reduce the besieged place by famine, is a prohibition of all commerce and intercourse in the besieged place. The fact that the goods themselves were not directly impeded was not to the point. So, having referred to a decision of the United States Supreme Court, Grotius and the celebrated Admiralty Judge Lord Stowell, the learned Baron concluded that the effect of the siege of Paris was to cut off entirely all foreign connection and correspondence so that the goods in this case were restrained or prevented from leaving Paris by the operation of that siege, and that was within the insured peril of restraint of princes. The principle established in that case that there could be a constructive total loss of goods where they themselves were unharmed 
but could not be delivered because of the marine adventure being frustrated by reason of war or some other restraint, remained after the Marine Insurance Act was passed. It was confirmed by the House of Lords in British and Foreign Marine Insurance Company in Sanday in 1916. There, British ships were carrying cargo from South America intended for Hamburg, the cargo being insured in London. The then the First World War was declared whilst the ships were on their voyage and they diverted to British ports at the suggestion of the Admiralty. The cargo owners sued for constructive total losses, arguing that the frustration of the voyage entitled them to claim. The House of Lords held that was correct, but the decision caused surprise in the marine insurance market because they considered that this meant that they were liable for risks of more a political nature rather than those of violence. The result was the creation of a standard clause, the frustration clause. This was in the form of a warranty, that is a promise by the insured that something would not occur, warranted free from any claim based upon loss of or frustration of the insured voyage or adventure caused by arrests, restraints, or detainments of kings, princes, and peoples. The question of the degree of deprivation of possession needed to amount to a CTL remained in issue for more than a century. It is considered at length by Sir Christopher Stoughton in the Bamburi. There, the vessel had been detained, but the officers and crew could get on board. The judge decided that the test was whether the insured had free use and disposal of the vessel, a phrase which is now used in the standard detainment clause which I will mention again in a minute. The issue of deprivation of possession arose again in a case that I argued as counsel. Nice to see uh, that uh, my junior, Richard Lord, is present here this evening. The case was Royal Boscalis, Westminster and Mountain. It arose out of Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. The insured dredgers were working in the Shat al-Arab and were detained. The insured gave a notice of abandonment of the vessels claiming a CTL. Subsequently, the insured obtained the release of the crew and the dredgers by paying secretly a ransom to the Iraqi government in breach of sanctions. The insureds claimed as an alternative to a CTL that the ransom payment was a sue and labor expense. Many issues arose in the case, which was probably the most interesting one that I argued at the bar. But on the issue of whether there had been a CTL by reason of loss of possession of the vessel, Mr. Justice Ricks held on the facts that they had not. The other problem which remained after Rodo Canacci was the question of how long the detention had to be. Eventually, the issue was solved by having a standard clause in what became war and strikes clauses called the Institute Detainment Clause and that was its name from 1983 onwards. There had been an additional clause in use before then. The detainment clause states that if the vessel had been the subject of capture, etc., and the insured had lost the free use and disposal of the vessel for a continuous period, usually stated to be 12 months, that is sufficient to constitute a constructive total loss. The problem in the Royal Boscalis case was that the detention had not been for so long. That led to interesting expert evidence on the state of mind of Saddam Hussein at the time that the notice of abandonment was given and rejected by the underwriters. Well, as you can imagine, we had fun with that in the course of cross-examination. So to the next topic, how war or the threat of it has led to the separation of marine risks from war risks in marine insurance policies, and then to the development of two sets of standard clauses now known as the Institute Clauses. As we've seen, the old SG policy wording had stated that the perils that were insured against included of the seas, men of war, fire, enemies, pirates, rovers, thieves, jettison, letters of marked and countermarked, surprisals, takings at sea, arrests, restraints, and detainments of all kings, princes, and peoples, and barratry. The total list, 15 specific perils, 
was a comprehensive cover against most kinds of damage that were thought likely to occur to a ship or cargo on the high seas. But you'll notice of the 15 identified perils, 11 relate to some sort of violence on the high seas. As Arnold puts it, protection against human malice was regarded by ship owners and merchants as the most important part of their insurance cover. Given the high risk of loss by a war peril in the 18th century, underwriters sometimes inserted a clause in policies which excluded that risk. This was again in the form of a warranty, a contractual promise by the insured that the vessel or cargo would be free of capture and seizure. This became known as the FC and S clause, and indeed the term is still used as a shorthand. An early example is in 1739, in a policy on the hull of the charming Peggy for a voyage from North Carolina to London. This was during the so-called War of Jenkins' Ear between Spain and Britain. British ships trading from America were in danger of being seized by Spanish naval vessels, hence the exclusion in the policy. The evidence was that the charming Peggy had set sail but had not been seen since. Underwriters argued that because there was an exception in the policy, it was up to the insured to prove that the loss occurred in the manner alleged, i.e. she sank at sea. Interestingly, there was evidence from witnesses in the trade that if a vessel goes missing, then the presumption is that she has foundered at sea. The presumption is now enshrined in Section 58 of the Marine Insurance Act. The issue in that case was left to the jury who found for the claimant. Although this FCNS clause existed, it wasn't used much after 1815. In the ensuing period, as the historian of Lloyd's DEW Gibbs states, neither the strength of our national forces nor the capacity of underwriters had been tested by experience. However, the attitude of Lloyd's underwriters and insurance companies in London to war risks changed dramatically in the last 20 years of the 19th century and did so for two allied reasons. First, there was the invention of the torpedo in 1862 and subsequently the launch of the first submarine by the French Navy in 1893. This new threat was dramatized in a short story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which imagined a single French submarine stationed off the mouth of the Thames, torpedoing British merchantmen as they entered or left the estuary. Secondly, Anglo-French rivalry, particularly in Africa, grew strongly once France had picked herself up after the Prussian defeat. Whilst Britain looked more to the east, Kenya, Uganda, France concentrated on North Africa. It had annexed Algeria in 1834 and West Africa. British forces bombarded Alexandria in 1883 in order to quell the Urabi revolt against the Khedivate, which threatened the Anglo-French control over Egyptian finances and their joint control of the Suez Canal. The British effectively then took over management of the Egyptian government, and the de facto governor of Egypt was Evelyn Baring, first Earl of Cromer. He recommended the British occupation continue, and it did. This alarmed the French, who wished to prevent British control of Eastern Africa from Cape to Cairo. Thus, the French expanded into what Lord Salisbury, the British Prime Minister for much of the 1890s, euphemistically called the light soil areas. Tension between the two powers was high throughout the 1880s, but reached new levels from 1895. Colonel Jean-Baptiste Marchand, who had been posted to what is now Mali in 1885, hatched a project with the Ministry of Colonies in Paris to lead an expedition across Africa to a settlement on the White Nile with a possible intention to damn it. The Assemblée Nationale agreed to finance the plan, and in 1897, Marchand is set off with a band of 150 men, including porters. This alarmed the British, 
who started a two-pronged movement to foil the French. General Kitchener was instructed to move south into Sudan, where he had to fight the local leaders to make progress. At the same time, there was an attempt to build a railway north from Nairobi through Uganda into Sudan. Marchand reached Fashoda on the White Nile in July 1898 and raised the French flag. After the Battle of Omdurman in September 1898, Kitchener and his flotilla of gunboats forces also reached Fashoda. Ultimately, after a standoff and with both countries' navies at readiness for war, the French foreign minister de Classe ordered Marchand to abandon Fashoda. In France, he mutated from l'Echo de Fashoda to le Martyr de Fashoda, but war avoided. Here you can see Marchand in his uh, uh, small boat with the French flag coming up to um, surrender to Kitchener, who is on the deck of his gunboat on the White Nile. The threat of war made underwriters at Lloyd's and in the company's market nervous. In 1896, the London Assurance wrote to the committee of Lloyd's suggesting that there be a rule that a clause excluding war risks should be inserted in standard marine policies of both Lloyd's and companies. That was rejected. Yet the tension caused by Marchand's expedition resulted in a reversal of policy. The committee called a general meeting of underwriting members on the 15th of June 1898 to consider a resolution that in future all risks of war should be excluded from all Lloyd's policies unless a special agreement should be reached that they be covered. That resolution was passed. As D.E.W. Gibb put it, the resolution was a decree of divorce between war and marine risks, and the twain have not been one flesh since then. Here's the old uh, room at Lloyd's. You can see the Lutine bell. Uh, and so these were the underwriters who would have been passing uh, the uh, resolution, although this is a picture taken a bit later. The following year, a further resolution was passed to the same effect. The different nature of marine risks and war risks was therefore recognised, and they had thenceforth to be separately insured. The result was what Arnold described as a convoluted method of insuring against war risks. But it continued until the new marine policy terms and institute clauses for marine and war risks were introduced in 1983. The simple course would have been made to have made a separate war risk policy that covered the risks that were excluded by the FCNS clause. Instead, war risks insurance covered the risks excluded from the standard form of English marine insurance policy by the FCNS clause. So, in order to recover in respect of a loss from one of the war risks, there were two questions to be answered. Was the loss caused by one of the perils covered by the ordinary marine policy wording? If so, was it then excluded by the FCNS clause? This convoluted method leads to the last topic I want to touch on, namely causation. There is one particular case arising from a wartime casualty that has been very influential on the law of causation in relation to marine insurance and indeed the law of causation generally. It's Leyland Shipping Company against Norwich Union Fire Insurance Society. When the war against Germany was declared in August 1914, the Royal Navy immediately put into operation a blockade of all German shipping, following the example of the blockade in the Napoleonic Wars. It was ultimately successful. By 1918, Germany was near starvation. But in early 1915, the German Navy retaliated. It declared that the area around the British Isles was a war zone in which all merchant ships, including those from neutral countries, would be attacked by the high seas fleet. The German Navy enlarged its submarine fleet and used it with increasing effect up until the torpedoing of the British passenger ship Lusitania on the 7th of May 1915. 
she was carrying 128 United States citizens who were amongst the 1,215 passengers who lost their lives at the sinking. President Woodrow Wilson protested strongly to the German government. The German Navy suspended U-boat operations altogether from September 1915 to February 1917. In January 1915, Icaria was on a voyage. From, here's a German U-boat of the era. It was on a voyage from South America to La Havre and London and was insured for marine risks, including perils of the seas, but the policy contained an FCNS clause in a form then current, warranted free of capture, seizure, and detention, and the consequences thereof, and also from all consequences of hostilities or warlike operations, whether before or after the declaration of war. On the 30th of January 1915, the vessel approached La Havre and stopped to take on a pilot, some 25 miles northwest of the port. She was then struck by a torpedo fired by a German U-boat. She was hit abreast of the number one hatch, making two large holes in the vessel and filling the number one hold with water. The crew left in a tug, fearing Icaria might sink. But she kept afloat and she was taken to the Quai de Scale à La The courts found as a fact that had she been able to stay there, she would have been saved. However, a gale sprang up and the vessel ranged and bumped against the quay. The port authorities feared she might sink and block the quay, which was being used to land military supplies. Therefore, they ordered her away and she went to anchor at the outer harbour. There she took the ground at every low tide as her bow was down so much because of the water in the number one hold. The bulkhead between the numbers one and two holes gave way and the vessel became a total loss on the 2nd of February. The issue before the courts was whether, as the claimants argued, the loss was by perils of the seas, that is, as a result of the damage suffered at the outer harbour where she sank, or was a loss by hostilities, viz. the torpedo. The test laid down in Section 55 of the Marine Insurance Act was, and is, that an insurer is liable for losses proximately caused by a peril insured against. Before this case, it was common to ascribe the last cause of the loss as the proximate cause. That approach was rejected in the Leyland shipping case. Mr Justice Rowlett and the Court of Appeal held that the loss was proximately caused by the torpedo, so the insurers were uh, able to rely on the FC&S exclusion. The House of Lords agreed. Lord Shaw of Dunfermline gave the speech that analysed the issues of causation best, in my opinion. He cautioned against too much theorising. He rejected the notion that causation is a chain and thought it was something more like a net. The proximate cause was the efficient cause. In that case, the cause was the torpedo. Leyland shipping remains the leading cause on what is meant by leading case on what is meant by proximate cause in the context of marine insurance. Although its application, uh, where there are two or more causes uh, that are concurrent, has caused difficulties. Judges have resorted to an appeal to common sense standards to decide amongst competing causes. See, for example, the speech of Lord Wright in Yorkshire Dale Steamship and the Minister of War Transport, the Coxwold, in 1942. That was another case on whether the loss was a war risk or a marine risk. Lord Hoffman, in an interesting article on causation in the Law Quarterly Review in 2005, adopting a remark of Lord Keynes about economic theories adapted, adopted by those in authority, that said, this is Lord Hoffman, if you're looking for the intellectual influences on the older judicial members of the House of Lords, the best way is to ask what was new and exciting in legal philosophy 50 years ago. That, he thought, was not a sure guide. In the end, Lord Hoffman said, a judge has to decide as a matter of law what causal connections the law requires 
and then decide as a question of fact whether the claimant has satisfied the requirements of the law. That, I think, is precisely what was done by the judges in Leyland Shipping. And it was done by the Supreme Court, I respectfully suggest, most recently in Financial Conduct Authority and Arch Insurance, dealing with the causation in a case of business interruption insurance cover and losses caused by COVID. But enough of war and laws. What about the Macedonia? Jonathan's instructing solicitors were Clyden Co, who from 1975 had been sending an increasing amount of shipping and marine insurance work to Chambers. Jonathan became one of their most frequently instructed counsel. In this case, as in many others, Jonathan was led by Sidney Kentridge, as he then was, who had not long before joined Chambers from South Africa, where he was already a very distinguished senior counsel. The case concerned a claim by an individual, Mr. Graham Vaughan, who had bought for £10,000 a consignment of corned beef, which had been condemned. He insured the consignment at Lloyd's for £1 million. After unsuccessful attempts to sell the rotting corned beef in Cyprus, Mr. Vaughan bought a rust bucket of a ship the Macedonia, and loaded the cargo on board. The ship sailed from Larnaca, Cyprus, and sank a few miles out in calm conditions. <laughs> Mr. Vaughan claimed on the cargo insurance. Clydes acted for the underwriters, and they alleged that the ship and cargo had, in the time-honoured phrase, been deliberately cast away with the knowledge and privity of the Ashered, in short scuttled. As always, underwriters sent out investigators to the port nearest the scene of the sinking. In Larnaca Market, the sleuth found a large ship's lantern made of brass, three feet high. The number, you can just see it, showed that it had been supplied to Macedonia many years before. The lantern, like everything else valuable on board, had been stripped before the last voyage. The trophy was brought back to Clyde's office and kept there till the trial. Its existence didn't have to be disclosed to the claimants, but Mr. Vaughan did have to give evidence. Sidney asked him in that deliberate magisterial delivery, which was one of his hallmarks as an advocate, whether the vessel had been stripped of anything of value before the last voyage. Mr. Vaughan thrice denied it. Then the lantern, which had been smuggled into the courtroom and hidden below the junior's bench, was flourished triumphantly by Jonathan and offered as exhibit number one. The claimant abandoned his claim soon thereafter. Richard, thank you. That was an absolute tour de force. Uh, magnificent. Uh, I told you that Richard is a brilliant lawyer. And as counsel, it's always incredibly satisfying when a witness comes so spectacularly up to proof. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, now, I'm going to permit a few questions. I put the emphasis on the few because it is gone seven o'clock. And one of Jonathan Hurst's many aphorisms was that time after seven o'clock spent without a drink in one's hand was time wasted. In fact, Jonathan, in my first six months, advised me that if I was having an evening pleading, I would need a bottle of claret because nothing helped pleading so much as claret. This was advice that I rejected. Uh, I am going to, however, take some few questions. So if you have anything burning, you're going to have to make sure that you're at the front of the queue. But I'm at the front of the queue because, Richard, I would like to know. I know I should know the answer to this, but I can't remember it. In Boscalis and Mountain, was the claim for sue and labour on the ransom paid for the vessel uh, successful? Well, it was successful at first instance uh, to 50%. Uh, Bernard Ricks was with us on all the law on sue and labour uh, and on the facts, but uh, the, he said, based on an old case, and I can't remember the name, it's a decision of Mr Justice Channel, and it was in 1903, and I can't remember the cage either. 
that uh, because it was a ransom paid on behalf of for, for the ships and the crew, you had to divide it in half. And when we got to the Court of Appeal, I'm afraid we lost. Bernard said to me after he'd read the judgment, the Court of Appeal think I don't know my ass from my elbow. And he was quite sure he did, and I was too. But Lord Justice Phillips, as he then was, said, um, it is salt in the wound, but we think that Mr. Justice Channel's approach is wrong, and if they had recovered on sewer of labour, they would have got the lot. Uh, the case was due to go to the House of Lords and was going to be heard at the same time as another case, which I'd argued in the Court of Appeal, called the Star Sea, uh, which all, was all about the duty of utmost good faith post-contract. Um, uh, but uh, sadly, the, uh, the owners of the dredgers decided to settle the case on the basis of what they got from Bernard, uh, and it never went to the Lords. And I never uh, argued the Star C in the Lords because I'd taken Queen Schilling. Right. There's a hand up over there. Yes. Could, could, do you want to take give the... Because I, I need to be, to be sure I can hear what you say exactly, because apparently the mic won't pick it up for the recording. So what I have to repeat roughly or exactly what you say so that it's going to be recorded. I was merely suggesting that you should perhaps have added in your summary of the Court of Appeal in Boscalis that the reason why we lost was because Lord Justice Pill happened upon a new point that had occurred to no one else, that it was against public policy to pay ransoms. Uh, yeah, well, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Siobhan, for that. Yes, it was, it was a great disappointment, I have to say, that um, and we, well, the, the, there was one member of the um, of the Court of Appeal who became the president of the family division, who used to refer to Lord Justice Pill as Lord Justice Ock. I won't say any more. <laughs> All desperate for a drink, I'm sure. Thank you all.